Hi! You're probably wondering what pieces of Planet Coaster proficiency I have to offer that Silverette, the Lady Designer, Nerd Chacho, Little Socks, and more haven't already covered, right? Or maybe why I'm bothering with this in 2022, or just why this video is so freaking long. And here's the thing, I've come through almost every tutorial in existence, and if you want tips on making realistic, good looking parks, those are your people. Their advice is concise and well structured, 10 out of 10. But what I want to try to impart to you dear viewer, is the actual creative process behind coming up with ideas and then bringing them to life in Planet Coaster. It's what I tried to do for Spore, and it turned out alright, so we're either hitting two for two here or a respectable 50-50. The only issue though is that Planet Coaster is a lot harder, so I want to focus on a few main categories, ideation and inspiration, layout, workflow, and general technique. Since ideation is the hardest one to explain, I'm going to try to tackle it first right after one very important tidbit. The very first thing I want to get out of the way is the difference to me between an amusement park and a theme park. Amusement parks are places like the Cedar Fair Parks or Six Flags, parks that rely almost entirely on their rides and snow cones so big that they turn your poop green to draw crowds. They might have some theming here and there, but they aren't very immersive. Some folks enjoy building amusement parks because they have a genuine interest in roller coasters and realism. They build parking lots and backstage access and transfer tracks. That is not my cup of tea. I prefer to build theme parks. Theme parks don't need the sickest rides, they just need to make your experience as unique, special, and memorable as humanly possible so that you're willing to pay the heinous ticket price to get in. In the greater realm of theme parks though, there are folks who make parks like this that are insane. Totally off the charts in terms of creativity and artistry, but they're so great that it's difficult to imagine them as a real theme park that you could visit tomorrow if you wanted to. They take theming to the next level, they make something more than a theme park, and make you feel like you're in an entirely different world that might abide by different laws of physics, or may even have magic systems at work. These kinds of parks I love to visit, but they're not my cup of tea to build either. My favorite kinds of parks are those that walk the line between these two. Parks that are grounded in realism, but have strong enough and slightly impractical theming to make you believe that you're somewhere else for a moment. So with that said, this video is about theme parks about strong theming and immersion with a touch of realism. If you prefer to build totally realistically, the other tutorials I mentioned will almost assuredly do a better job. So how do you start? How do you turn this into this? Thing is, there's really no right answer with what your first step should be. Some people start with an entrance and some people start with a ride. Others might make a castle first, etc, etc. This is where ideation starts, and to get good ideas flowing, I think it's good to ground yourself right out of the gate. The way that I work in this game is by putting my camera down on the ground at eye level by naming a staff member Tejidcam, and fully immersing myself in what I've made. To immerse yourself like this, you gotta be willing to be a big goofy nerd. I pretend to have full on conversations with my girlfriend or my family as I pretend to drive up and park. I literally sit here in my chair and pretend to be in the car like, did you remember the sunscreen? You got the tickets? Yeah, they'll let us bring our hydro flasks in if they're empty, come on. Making yourself believe that you could actually be in your park and then really thinking about how the entire experience would feel in every way will help keep you motivated and inspired. If you can repeatedly put yourself in your park and be excited about it, you'll just want to keep making it better and better. That's why I choose to start with an entrance in some kind of parking lot or station. It makes it possible for me to imagine pulling up to the park to start my day there. You can arrive at your park in any which way, whether it's in a car, a train, a boat, or something wilder like dropped off by a phoenix, summoned through a portal, landed in a rocket, or whatever you can imagine. After you get inside of the park, the next and most important question for you to answer is how do I want this park to feel? God, this is hard to explain, but bear with me. To get all of this straight in my head, I usually position my camera in the right spot, then close my eyes and ask myself all of these questions. How hot is the sun on my skin? Is there a breeze? Is it dry or humid out? What climate am I even in? Do I need lots of shade and water stations? Or do I need space heaters and hot cocoa? What kinds of scenery themes and plants fit this environment? Am I building a mega park backed by a multi-billion dollar corporation, or am I building a smaller, more local park? 
Do I want things to be loud and exciting here, or calm and inviting? What are the crowds gonna be like? Do I need to make things extra spacious, or can I get away with a more condensed layout? Imagine yourself, you, right here, on this path. What would make you the absolute happiest? Imagine the sun on your skin and the breeze rolling through. What do you want to hear? What do you want to smell? Do you want to be awestruck by what you see or do you want something quaint and inviting? Standing in this spot in my park, I imagine it in the early morning, the smell of flowers and wet soil and the cool air. There's a slight breeze that's carrying the scents of cinnamon, blueberry and coffee and warm pastries out from the main street. Walking down the main street, I imagine getting my favorite coffee, chatting with whoever I'm with, listening to the leaves rustle in the trees as we make our way into the apex zone. I made that walk over and over and over again while working on this. I got myself in that mental space and then walked through the tunnel literally over a hundred times because when I was feeling unmotivated or if I was losing patience, walking in again and still being happy with what I'd made kept me going. Mentally putting yourself in your park, walking around and imagining what you would want in a perfect place is what will feed your ideas and it's what lets you decide on what you want to make next. If imagining your perfect park doesn't help all that much, then try imagining the worst park that you can think of. I'm gonna put Six Flags Magic Mountain on blast here because it is everything I try to avoid when playing Planet Coaster. Just focusing on the entrance, the designs kind of blow, the colors suck, the layout is somehow too cramped with all of these planters but also too open to the point that it feels confusing. Like am I supposed to go down here? The rides are over this way but does this connect to anything? It's weird. Everything is wrong for me here. Once you realize what you don't like about a park, you naturally want to avoid all of those things in your own. Busy sign, simple sign. Harsh colors, muted colors. Confusing layout, go right here please. Whether you're using your dream park as inspiration or your nightmare park, the commonality between the two is that when you are coming up with a layout, you need reference. This is imaginative realism. How to Paint What Doesn't Exist by the incredible artist James Gurney. You want to know one of the tips he gives you on how to make your ideas reality? It's to sculpt them first so that you have a 3D model to work from. He really says that when you have no reference, you make one. Reference is essential in making anything, and it's no different in Planet Coaster. My main street borrows from Disneyland, the hotel is inspired by the Grand Californian, and this spot that I have yet to finish is my version of a downtown Disney area. Everything is based on elements of real life parks and places that I've enjoyed. I could have built something like the City Walk outside of Universal, but remembering those questions from earlier, what environment am I in? How do I want to feel? The City Walk wouldn't have fit with what I was shooting for here. Once you know how you want the park to feel, try and think of places that you've been to where you've felt that way before. Doesn't matter if it was in a theme park or not. I wanted waking up in this hotel to feel the same way that it felt when I first stepped out of Kermoran in, in Witcher 3. This whole downtown area is eventually going to look like this shopping center that I used to work at. When the monorail pulls into my apex zone, I wanted that reveal to make me feel the same way that coming through the tunnel to Inspiration Point in Yosemite did. To capture the sensation that you're aiming for, you have to think about where you've experienced that before, whether it's in a park, or a movie, or a game, and use those places as reference. Instead of worrying about making a good entrance, or a good queue, or a good hotel, try and just think of real world places that you've seen or enjoyed yourself, pull up some images, and use your favorite aspects of those places to guide your layout. I'm gonna keep it real with you, dear viewer. I suck at realistic aspects of layouts. I really do. In my main park, it's basically a big ring where all of the rides are stuck on the edges. There are multiple dead ends and spots with ridiculous stairs and ramps. I often choose to sacrifice realism in my layout to make things look the way I want them to. However, the two bits of realism that I really do try to stick with are keeping most of the area flat and not using stairs unless I absolutely have to. That way people in wheelchairs or anybody with mobility issues can still get around. When you go insane with the verticality, you have to imagine yourself there again. Yes, it's cool to have that verticality in your park, but imagine how bad your thighs would be burning after hiking out of a ride exit. I suppose in this section I should include what I know about paths, since that's what your layout is made of. I'm gonna recommend that if you really want to know paths perfectly, you watch Nerd Chacho's hour-long tutorial if you want super in-depth pathing tips, but I'm gonna power through the things that I use the most. Keyboard shortcuts are the most important part. 
Control will stop your paths from snapping together while you work on tighter designs. Shift will raise and lower your paths just like building pieces. Z is super slept on, I think, but if you hold it, it lets you do crazy things. Right here, if I just drag my cursor along this path, all it lets me do is snap another path to it at 90 degrees like normal, right? But when I hold Z, look what it lets me do. Look at that crazy angle. It's the magic key for filling spots. It's fantastic. Z is great. To make uniquely shaped plazas, you can lay down two paths to form the perimeter. Then when you go to fill in the center, you've got some options. You can either cram as much path as possible into the center and fill in these gaps by using flat pieces like concrete roofs that are color matched to the path and then lower just below it like this or you can make some nice planters or other bits of decor in these open spots. To make circular plazas like this, it's actually super super easy. You start off with a decently wide path, leave angle snap on, but you set your camera right here to follow and rotate. Then on your first bit of path, you go about two snaps in the direction you want and then just click and follow it all the way around like this. Now you can find a spot where the path connects nicely to it like so. Next, you turn angle snap off, turn your width down a tad, and then hold control to make another smaller circle inside. You then connect the inner circle anywhere that you can, making sure that even if the path is highlighted red, you try and click it anyways, because sometimes Planko's just a little dumb. Then again, you fill the gaps with a color matched piece and you've got a whole large walkable plaza. To make a slightly multi-leveled feel like this, which can be really useful, you lay down a large central path first then hold control and shift to position slightly elevated sidewalks. Then just let the sidewalk snap down to the main path for some nice curving slopes. To make small sets of stairs like this, there are two methods. One is more widely known, where you get a shop and position it slightly higher than the path. Then as you move the shop closer, it generates a small staircase. You add more path to make sure that it's locked in, delete the shop and your small staircase will stay. The trouble is, this only works for 4 meter wide paths. If you want something like this, it's a little trickier. You go to your elevated path, click to make a path at 90 degrees, then slap some large art shapes on the sides to give yourself markers. Now, delete that path, but go back and click in the same spot again to make an intersection point like this. Now hold control and position a piece of path below it within the markers and slide it close to that intersection point. Sometimes it'll just snap and give you a staircase, but other times you just need to force it by wiggling the path up and down. But there you have it, a small wide set of stairs. Again, just make sure that if you do this, you have a ramp somewhere so people can get down. I miss that here. My other pathing tips are to use the grid for paths whenever possible and then just figure out how to connect them. And if you're going through different elevations, make sure that you just use the flatten terrain button, but we'll get to that later. Okay, to recap, Ideation for your park starts with a feeling. You can either imagine how you want to feel in your dream park or think of the feelings that you want to avoid by considering places that kind of suck. Once you know the tone and feel of your park, it's important to use a reference to find real world examples where you've experienced that tonality before. You then take the elements of that place's layout and incorporate it into your park. However, if you're shooting for an immersive, slightly unrealistic theme park, you can get a little goofy with your layout if it helps you realize your vision. You can use the pathing tips I gave you and tutorials by Nerd Chacho, Geekism, and Silverette for even more pathing tips. With that foundation down, feeling, to tone, to layout, we can move on to execution. So, to explain how I work and how you might work in this game, executing ideas correctly still largely revolves around how you want a place to feel. The most important part of correctly executing your ideas isn't detailing, it is not theming, it is not lighting, it is not realism, it's sight lines. This is gonna be a lot, <laughs> but it's literally the most important part of this entire game. All right, in a theme park, your experience is manufactured by the architects and designers by controlling what you can see at any given moment. In Disneyland, when you're in Adventureland, all you can see is adventure theming. In Tomorrowland, all you can see is retro futuristic theming plus the Matterhorn because there can be mountains in the future. In Galaxy's Edge, all you can see is Star Wars. They accomplish this in a couple of ways. The first is by making sure that guests never get too far away from a building or some sort of natural barrier. To explain why this is crucial to controlling sight lines, looky here. Say for instance that I wanted to make new themed areas here and here, maybe one for Dishonored and one for Red Dead 2. 
An apex orbital cannon in the sky would ruin the theming for either of those zones, right? So what can I do? It'll take a lot of effort to keep the cannon hidden 100% of the time because I admit it is literally just too tall and in a really stupid spot, but it can be done by keeping buildings and other barriers close to the paths. Standing here, all I need to completely block the view of the cannon is a three wall high building. That's not unreasonable, and if I was building a dishonored zone, which would either look like this or like this, I could pull that off no problem because of how tall and dense these cities are. But if my other zone is Red Dead 2, I can't just make it all San Denis, right? So then I would have to use natural landscaping, rock formations, and tall trees to block people's vision in some spots. This is how you keep people immersed in your area. You block the outside world and make sure that they're completely sold on your illusions. For my apex zone, I used buildings and then built the whole thing surrounded by hills to block vision. It's completely impractical in real life to do this, but it works to completely isolate the park in the game. Without hills, the thing to remember though is to keep paths close to those sight barriers. The farther people are allowed to be from the barriers, the more they can see over. So to maintain immersion, you want people to be slightly boxed in so their sight lines are limited and controlled without the zone feeling claustrophobic. To accomplish that, you're going to want to make pockets within your themed zone. You can have buildings open for people to walk through or use verticality to make upper and lower levels to split up the crowd. You should also use transitional barriers like gates and archways to divide things and make it feel like you're always walking into something new. Disney did this all really, really well in Galaxy's Edge. This is the layout for the area. You can see that in the main outpost, the paths are all super condensed and separated by archways and other transitional barriers. This compartmentalized layout makes the park feel bigger because you are constantly walking into what feels like a brand new little pocket packed with details and new things to explore. This strip back here is a natural barrier where they built a hill and used tall trees so that when you're back here in the outskirts of the outpost, it doesn't even feel like you're in Disneyland. You cannot see or hear anything except for what they want you to in Galaxy's Edge. I tried to do things like this in my Apex Park by splitting it up into different zones. This is the entrance strip that leads to two rides this way, but we have this arch and this bridge as transitional barriers. This arch leads to this segment back here with the phase runner, the gravity well, and the waterfall, which feels like its own little spot because the dock sign and the cruiser form a wall up ahead that blocks your sight. You can see the big main building the whole time and I'll explain that choice in a second, but I only built this cruiser because I needed this part of the park to feel like its own separate thing, and I really like it here because of that. There are bits of other buildings peeking over the cruiser that should make people excited to see what lies beyond, but by confining people's vision to just this spot, it makes people pay attention to what's immediately around them instead of just wanting to race through it. This archway also makes the docks feel more unique because when you step onto them, it's the only spot in the park where the natural landscaping drops away and you're somewhere much more condensed and industrial. Then we have the next portion of the loop with the extravaganza. Revenant's rocks and ropes back here is also divided to feel more secluded. And then there's this building. I built this building to block sight from over here. We need this building because without it, the stuff back here is just too far away to make sense of. It just looks like a wad of track and concrete and trees. So adding a building to block it all makes it so that this whole central lake is confined to its own chunk that can be taken in all at once without being overwhelming. So quick recap of all of that. You immerse people in your themed areas by controlling what they can see. You do this by keeping buildings or terrain close to the paths so that people can't see over and out into other parts of the park. To make things feel less claustrophobic, you compartmentalize your zone so that it always feels like you're walking into something new. You also don't want people to be able to see for too long of a distance, because from too far away, your gorgeous buildings and immaculate coasters will just look like a confusing ball of nothingness. The last bit, but the biggest bit, of sightlines is composition. Composition in art is the word we use to describe the arrangement and organization of an image. Composition is my weakest attribute as an artist, and there's a lot to learn, like the rule of thirds, the golden ratio, but one of the hardest and most important compositional rules to use in Planet Coaster is filling out your frame. In Planco, your frame is your field of vision. 
and you want your field of vision to be as full as possible as often as possible. Think of any famous painting, Starry Night, La Gioconda, A Sunday on La Grande Jeanne. Every centimeter of the canvas is filled with something to engage you and move your eyes. So to explain why this is important in Planko, Let's go back and talk that good again on Magic Mountain. You may have been thinking in the last part, well, what if my park doesn't have anything tall that I need to block? What if I just keep everything flat and low to save myself some trouble? Do I still need paths close to buildings? If you want immersion, yes. Look at this. Do you see how everything in the park stops right here? There's nothing pulling your focus down into the park. There's nothing immersing you in the zone. It's all the same height, same colors on a straight line of a street. Green Lantern over here doesn't exist anymore. It's been replaced by the Wonder Woman coaster, but I still don't think it adds that much to the sight lines of this street. The one good thing about this angle is that it kind of focuses your attention on the loop and the little tiny sign for Batman. But having the park be so open like this just takes you right out of it. Compare that to Hogsmeade at Universal. You see how tight and tall these buildings are? Even if you look straight up, you can't get away from the theming. This is what you're striving for. This is how you keep people sucked into your zone. I should also mention that theme parks typically use forced perspective in a lot of places, where the ground level is a normal scale, but the upper levels of buildings are much smaller. Disney specifically makes the second floor at a 5 8 scale and the third at a 1 half scale. This effect is definitely cool, but I haven't found it to be all that useful in Planet Coaster, and it's really hard to pull off because the windows and decor are all one set size. When you begin building, you really want to consider how you're going to pull people's focus in and direct it where you want. So, like we've discussed, you want buildings or other barriers right up on the path to physically block vision and keep people immersed in the theme of the area. Doing that will fill up most of your field of vision and make everything look nice and lively. But it's not possible to do that 100% of the time, right? That would be insane. There will be spots where you're too far away from buildings or sight barriers to have them fully impact your field of vision. So in those spots, you want to give people something cool to focus on. When your immersive segments end, you want them to direct people's focus to a particular landmark or weenie. We call these focal points weenies because Walt Disney said that he wanted people's eyes to be glued to certain things like the castle, the Matterhorn, or Splash Mountain in the same way that his dog's eyes got glued to little cocktail weenies as treats. Your weenie could be anything, a building, a rock formation, the top of a lift hill, just something that's impressive and interesting that will hold people's focus as they move through the area. So again, in Universal, when you're rounding the corner in Hogsmeade and your line of sight opens up, it's directed straight to Hogwarts. When you're in Tomorrowland and you round this corner into an open plaza, your focus is right on Space Mountain. This is how you pull people along and make it exciting to explore your park. In Amber Rock, the main weenie is obviously this big ass power plant and you can see how the sightlines work with everything we've talked about so far. Coming through the tunnel, there's a natural barrier and a building right up on the path to immerse people and control where your vision is going. You're either looking at the Tesla Coiler building back here, the bright blue bridge, but the thing that I really want everybody to be looking at is the giant launch tower for Valkyrie's coaster that goes over the power plant. That's what pulls people in and as they walk in, the hill on the side pulls away slightly and reveals the waterfalls of the power plant. The people walking in realize how big this thing really is and then they finally round the corner and the park fully opens up for the first time as they look out across the lake. I did this so that people would have an extended ooh ah moment that started at the tunnel and lasted until they got here. We can also see the two transitional barriers from earlier here. One is the bridge and the second one is this arch. You see this off to the side and it might catch your interest for a second. And as you round this hill, you see the Phase Runner, which is a secondary weenie that pulls you in and makes you want to see what's around this corner. Referencing Disney again, when you come around this archway in Galaxy's Edge and catch a glimpse of the Falcon, you're pulled out of this street and into this new larger zone. You want things to keep slowly coming into view so that people feel compelled to keep walking to see what's around the next corner. This is how you keep your park engaging and immersive. Recapping all of that, you want to keep things condensed and immersive, but when you do open the park up, you want to give people solid focal points and landmarks that will make them excited to go farther in. 
You control exactly what people are looking at by carefully placing terrain, buildings, and trees to compose your shots just like an artist composes a painting. Like it or not, there are three more very important things to keep in mind when you're doing all of this. One is vanishing points. The vanishing point in an image is the point where all of the lines converge. It's where your focus is naturally drawn to. So right here, if we were to trace all of the lines in our vision, we can see that the vanishing point pulls our eyes this way, towards the back half of the park. Even though this building isn't a showstopper, it's made evident that it's important because everything is pointing straight at it. It's very hard to do this in close quarters, but this can be useful in open spots like this or maybe down a main street. The second thing is framing shots. You can't do this all the time, but when you can, it's massively rewarding. You can make frames using your scenery like this. Leaving the extravaganza, the track frames up to this shot with the mountain, Valkyrie's Pilot Academy, and Pathfinder Plaza below. It's like a little thumbnail that you can walk by in real life. For a closer one, this arch frames this section of the docks, which highlights the wolf for Loba's cruiser and the industrial utilitarian aesthetic that you're walking into. This support brace frames Valkyrie's Pilot Academy and serves as a transitional barrier where it also feels like you're walking into something new. From here, the launch tower is framed, and using a more natural barrier over here, this let me frame all of this together to feel like one cohesive structure. All of these spots were done very intentionally to create scenic places where people might stop and go, oh wow, that's cool, and maybe take a picture. Okay, the last and most important bit for composition is using the three layers of background, midground, and foreground, or the parallax effect. This effect is what's used to describe how objects at different distances move at different speeds relative to you. Things that are close to you move faster, and things that are farther away move slower. This animation from Team Miracles shows what I'm talking about. Notice the grass and rocks moving quickly in the front, the clouds behind moving slower, and the mountains way back here moving the slowest. This makes the mountains feel farther away even though it's just a 2D image on a screen, and it lets your brain understand that the clouds are floating between the character and the mountains. So, looking at this sightline again, the plants and rocks in the front move very quickly. This stuff back here moves a little slower, and the mountain way back there moves the slowest. There's even another mini layer right here, where the dam moves slower than the building in front. It lets your brain accurately gauge distances and understand where everything is in relation to one another. When you're walking straight towards something like this, the objects closest to you will get higher in your field of vision. The mountain in the back shrinks very quickly, and the hill behind the runway gradually shrinks away as the runway grows larger. Again, when everything is moving at different speeds like this, it makes things feel larger and lets your brain understand how far everything is from you. You want those layers, that foreground, midground, and background, to be interacting at all times. It's why these trees are here between the arch and the phase runner. If we take them away, yeah, you can see more clearly, but this whole thing just feels static as you're walking towards it. With the trees here, the phase runner feels farther back, the whole area feels larger. These trees do the same thing, but they make the power plant feel farther away. It's also why I added these strings of banners. They provide a mid-ground layer that separates the lifeline building from the main building way back there. You always want to do your best to have those three layers, foreground, midground, and background, working together to have everything feel dynamic and deep. It can be super simple too, just one tree. If I take this away, you see how this back wall just feels flat? With a tree here that's closer to you now, that back wall feels separated and the entire plaza is more dynamic. That's why composition and sightlines are so important. To pull people in and make them believe that they're somewhere else, you need to be commanding their attention at every opportunity. You do that by keeping your paths close to buildings or natural terrain and compartmentalizing your area using transitional barriers. You compose your sightlines by keeping people's fields of vision as full as you can manage, and when you open things up, you make sure that you have an enticing focal point that people will be drawn to. To control this sense of scale for the area, you want to always be using three layers of background, midground, and foreground so that the area feels more dynamic and impressive. Just using the things that we've covered so far will push your parks so much farther if you haven't been using them. If you can control sightlines and make your park feel immersive, you don't need to be great at building. I threw this together in just under like 20 minutes, and watch this. Zero effort put into the buildings, I just made them border the path. 
We're initially pulled into the area with this flat ride, and we can see the layers of background, midground, and foreground all working together. As we get to this fork, we spot this fountain and a glimpse of a track that pulls us somewhere new through this arch. In here, we open the path up slightly to let people breathe and focus their attention right at this track coming over a hill. If I were to continue on, that track coming over the hill would pull us right out of this zone and around the corner to see what else is waiting. All of that done without any fancy building, just mindfulness of how we want this place to feel. Once you've got a layout and some sight lines in mind, you can start thinking about how your rides are gonna interact with all of it. Maybe you want a lift hill or a cool inversion to be a weenie. Maybe you want the track cutting close overhead as the ride takes people on a fast paced run through your zone. I never, ever, ever have solid plans for rides, but I always come up with a story for them because that, more than anything, will dictate how you build them. Think of the Velocicoaster. You start in a raptor paddock from the Jurassic World movies and then you're let out of the cage and you feel like a raptor tearing around the enclosure in tight turns at high speeds and then you get your chance to escape and you run through the tunnel, jump up and now you're free. You're running out in the park going crazy. There's a narrative to follow for the rider that makes them feel like velociraptors breaking out of their enclosure. Or Hagrid's motorbike adventure. Riders are on magical motorbikes, so the track is pretty flat and you really lean into the curves like you would on a motorcycle. The bikes have a mind of their own though because they're magical of course, and they end up taking the riders into the forbidden forest. And the whole time, this ride is designed with the riders in mind, so the ride tells you to cast certain spells at points to make you feel like you're a wizard on a magical motorbike. It is constantly engaging and exciting. God. Damn, Universal's been killing it. But you see the point of coming up with a story for your rides? Instead of just saying, in my pirate area, I want a pirate themed coaster. So I'm just gonna put down pirate decor and that'll do. Take it farther. Who's the scourge of the seas in your park? Is it Captain Lockjaw or is it the Kraken? How are you gonna have riders fight them and escape with the treasure? Are you in a Western park on a mine train? What's gonna happen in the mine to make things more exciting? Do you want to explore caverns that people happen to find, or do you want to have something go wrong so you have to escape collapsing tunnels? When you're making immersive rides for a highly themed area, you have to have a story in mind that riders can experience. When you're really, really theming a coaster, don't just slap appropriate decor around. Come up with a fun and engaging story that people can be a part of and stay fixated on the whole time. Your ride will feel much better if you have somewhat of a beginning, rising action, climax, falling action, and conclusion, just like a book or a movie has. All right. So now that we've gone over getting the right feel and tone for your park and your rides and using good composition and sight lines to capture that, we can finally get into some actual building tips that will work for any theme under the sun. I do want to just quickly say that it's been three weeks since I started working on this video, so if you've enjoyed it so far, if you've learned something, just please consider subscribing. I always try my hardest with each video, so if you're into games, I do think that my content will be worth your time. And so, to begin part two, we need to go over choosing your theme. You should always try to choose a theme that you're somewhat familiar with. That's because in your head, you have what some folks call a visual library. As you live your life, you develop interests in certain things, right? Right. As you watch or play or read more and more of what you're interested in, you store a ton of that information in your head. The more you get invested and engrossed in those styles or aesthetics, the easier it's going to be for you to recreate them because you have a very solid frame of reference for what the end result should be. So for instance, I always gravitate towards sci-fi and fantasy, but you might be super into steampunk or ancient Mesoamerican temples. So this is my biggest piece of advice in the whole video right here. Instead of looking at the scenery themes that are available to you in the game and choosing one of those to build around, just think of what kinds of things interest you, then think about how you're gonna use the pieces in the game to bring that theme to life. You make the game conform to your ideas. You don't make your ideas conform to the game. The reason being, if you're letting the game dictate what you can and can't create, you'll lose motivation and inspiration because the end result will never be what you really pictured. So to accurately recreate things that you're interested in, guess what you still need? A ton of reference, that's right. My biggest tip for finding reference is to add the words concept art to whatever you're trying to find reference for. For example, if you're looking for reference to make a medieval village and you just Google medieval village, this is what you get. Not bad, honestly. There's a lot of useful work here. And it could fly, but check it out. 
If I Google medieval village concept art, woohoo! Look at the color, look at the life, look at the atmosphere. The job of a concept artist is to sell people on their world and their imagery. Looking for concept art will always give you images that are easier to draw inspiration from. Concept art images will include lots of decorations and other details that wouldn't exist in the practical real world, but that you absolutely need to create an immersive theme park. You can also use sites like Pinterest and ArtStation to get great results. Both sites are amazing for finding specific reference material. As a bonus, if you're trying to recreate something from a video game, it's very likely that you'll find the actual artists who worked on that game somewhere on ArtStation. Then you can just pull up their high quality images right there on the spot, it's great! You could also use Instagram to build a catered feed of images for a constant wave of ideas if you want. My explore page is a ton of sci-fi and fantasy art, but also a lot of titties for some reason. Might be a bug. I don't know. So, you've chosen one of your interests and googled concept art or real world examples for it. Now, how do you actually go about bringing it into Planko? Let's talk about workflow and technique. First off, get to know your pieces. Sizes, textures, angles. Scroll through the entire library, take everything out and look at it at least once. Not getting familiar with every piece you've got is like trying to build a Lego set without taking the bags out of the box. You need to know what you have to work with if you're gonna work efficiently. Knowing your pieces can also serve to inspire you. That's why I chose to use this building from The Witcher 3 as a reference example. I knew my pieces, so I was able to look at the building and determine whether or not I could pull it off in Planko. Even when you do know your pieces, you might want to lay out pieces that you think might help you when you're working. When I was building this torture chair, I laid out every every single small piece that I had available to me in the game so that I could look everything over instead of scrolling through a menu. Having the pieces physically in front of your eyes will help you figure out how to use them. You can also make your own custom scenery tags, which can be pretty handy, but it is a little tedious. You go to custom tags, add new tag, name it accordingly, then you go to the pieces you want, click add existing tag, and click the tag you made. So now, for this example, if I wanted to make another building in the same style, I just click the Novigrad filter and it pulls up every piece that I used for this building. The way that I want to explain my second tip is that you can use context to change what a piece is. For example, these are Bavarian shutters. But if you paint them black and put a bunch of sci-fi stuff around them, they look like vents. And I use them everywhere. Another example are the safety curbs painted blue to look like solar panels. A few more common ones are using the icing pieces as metalwork, the Christmas baubles as spire decorations, screen mounts as metal bolts, upside down emergency lights as stacks of cups, these tricolor banners as stacks of t-shirts, and more and more and more. This is the coolest part of the game because you get to look at every piece, understand what it is, but then also come up with ideas for what else it could be. The third tip, of course, is work smarter, not harder. There are a few main techniques here within this category. You can use the split selection from building button to great effect. Say for instance I built a whole room with a bunch of props in it, right? But then I think, hmm, I want some detail on this wall, so I do a design like this. Now, what if I want to fiddle with just the design in the future? What I can do is get all of the pieces selected once, then split them. So initially, I can use the existing walls and floors to center and snap everything with F. But now, I can work with just these pieces and I can quickly drag select them and move them around or tweak colors. Then when I'm finished, if I want, I can use the multi-select to group everything back into one building and move it around. Make sure that you're copying and pasting efficiently. Meaning if you have this design for a wall that you're planning on pasting multiple times, you don't include the side framing on the right. That way when you paste, you don't double those framing pieces up. Also, try to make sure that before you copy a wall or roof segment, you also add all of the details that you're going to want onto it. You might switch it up where you want to have one wall be a door and one wall has a window, but just make sure that you're fully happy with a segment before you paste it six times. Never, ever throw any of your builds out. If you've got an empty area and you're unhappy with the building, just shove it to the side. You might find a use for it later and you already spent a lot of time on it. Fourth tip is just to have patience. I really didn't want to show this, but this is my first version I did of that building from Witcher 3. I only looked at one reference angle, I ignored the proportions, I threw the roof together haphazardly, and the entire time all I was thinking was, yeah, this is good enough, I need to get this video done. But I knew I could do better, so I came back the next day, put on a podcast, and took my time. 
This is the second version. The roof is 10 times better, the arch is tighter and higher, it's more detailed, I tried harder on the first floor, I mean look at the doors. Even the half timbering on the side is nicer, it's still not a perfect replica of the reference and I don't think I want it to be, honestly, but it's way better than the first version because I spent an extra 30 minutes or so on it. Trying to build fast is a waste of your time. You need to pump the brakes and be willing to just relax and enjoy the process of creating something. If you rush things, they're gonna look rushed. If you're gonna spend time on something, make sure you do it right so you only ever have to do it once. Those are my tips for workflow. Know your pieces, organize them, consider how you could use different pieces to fit your needs, work smarter, not harder, when you can, and have the patience to do things to the best of your ability. The very last chunk of this video is just techniques, just cool, useful shit that I've picked up over the years, broken up into specific sections for buildings, lighting, rides, triggers, and terraforming. The first one goes for everything in the game. If you are copying pieces that are going to be directly adjacent to each other, you need to rotate them. The textures are the exact same here. You see how this dot and these marks are the exact same? But if we flip every other one, it's way less apparent and it looks more natural. The next tip has to do with your axes. Most of the time, you're going to be working with the relative axes and not the world axes, but on occasion, the game won't know how to make sense of the parts you're working with, and the axes will be misaligned like this. To fix this, you can just slap down some extra pieces and eventually it will align itself appropriately. As soon as things slip out of alignment like this, you will never get them to be seamless again. Do not try to force it. On the topic of correctly aligning things, arc shapes can be used to make anything you want, but they're also very useful as measurement tools. If you want to make sure that things are the same height, just lay out an arc shape and make sure that the same amount of the pieces clips through the top. To evenly space things, you really only need two of the objects. You place one down, space out the other, then copy both of them and position it so that two of the pieces perfectly overlap like this. Then you delete the overlapped piece, rinse and repeat perfectly even spacing. What you can also do if you're trying to evenly space things on a wall is drag your grid size to one and overlap gridded wall pieces like so. Then, as you hold F, you'll see that the pieces snap to the center of each wall. That'll evenly space things for you as well. This of course also works vertically if you change your grid height and overlap the walls. To make any large circular object like this, you want to lay out floor pieces that are about the size that you're shooting for. Then, stick whatever pieces you're building from in the middle of each side, then just select and copy those pieces around. It'll take a little elbow grease, but this is my preferred method for making round buildings. Sometimes when you're copy and pasting things or just overlapping in general, you'll run into this issue. This flickering is called Z-fighting, and it's basically the game not knowing which object it should render on top. It's always worth coming in and just barely tweaking one of the pieces to stop that flickering. When you're making something custom with small pieces, you need to be mindful of the render distance of those pieces. Very small pieces will not render at long distances, so if you do use small pieces, make sure that they're only visible from short distances. This gazebo is the example that I have for this. This top part of the roof is made out of very small brackets that don't render from this far out. But to prevent that from being apparent, I put this oak tree in the way. That way that the branch blocks your view of that part of the roof until you get really close. So on the ground, you won't notice that they aren't rendered in. When and if you are building something with more complex angles like this, make sure that you take the time to pop inside and delete any and all pieces that aren't visible from outside. It's a minor thing, but if it saves you a few hundred parts and then a couple extra frames, you'll be glad that you did it in the long run. On the topic of buildings with complex angles, the hardest part to handle is the roof. You can usually overlap buildings and stick them into each other. I think Grindelheim by Zarok is one of the nicest examples. Because for this station, you can see that the main structure has to follow the station itself, but Zarox layered a few other buildings at different angles on top of it to make things way more interesting. You just need to be mindful that when you overlap and layer things like this, that you remain aware of what's happening inside as well. You don't want to put all of this work into layering the exterior and then have the inside be all messed up. You can also handle the roofs for complex angles like this. In Mythgard, by Coaster Cad and FPS Ranger, you've got rounded buildings like this, right? 
and they handled the roof by keeping it straight over the minor curves and adding this tower segment to cover up the ugly spot where the roofs connect. Over here, you can see that the roofs kind of pop up in a few spots, but they obscure it with plants and other scenery. It's way harder to make complex angles with buildings at the same height like this. So if I do it, I usually just make the midsection at a different height so I can just sync everything together without worrying about a cohesive roofline. On to lighting! The way that you light things is going to vary greatly according to your theme, but some general tips are reflected light. If you shine a light down from the ceiling, it'll illuminate what's below it, sure, but what happens in real life? Light is reflected off of the surface and bounces back. So if you want things to look natural and somewhat realistic, you can look at the color of what the light is reflecting off of, grab some box lights, and shine a little bit of that color back at where it's coming from. To show the difference that it makes, I'll just take away these reflected lights real quick. This is with reflected light, and this is without. You see how much better that is? Reflected light is very important, and it's absolutely my biggest lighting tip. One thing that took me an embarrassing amount of time to figure out was that if you want dimmer lights, you can literally just make the color darker. That way, instead of using a billion box lights, you can sometimes use one darker colored area or floodlight to just throw a wee bit of light a decent distance. Themed lights can be difficult, especially in sci-fi settings because none of these freaking pieces actually project any light. So sometimes when you throw glowing pieces down, you can use extra lights to project light for them. It takes a lot of fiddling with to get it to feel right, but for things like screens, it really helps to add these backing lights. For these light fixtures, there are two arm lights in each one that double as actual lights and connection points for the cables. If you want to make it look like light is spilling out of a building at night, you have two courses of action. You can of course shine lights through the windows and doorways, but then you can either find a way to illuminate around where the light is coming from, or use colorable light panels and slip them into the windows like this. The only problem is that the render distance on these panels is absolutely awful and they maintain their color in daylight so it looks kinda funky. You can of course draw people's attention towards certain points using lights, but make sure that if you're doing that, that the color you choose is easy on the eyes. Having a bright ass neon blob constantly in your vision will drown out a lot of the rest of your lights. Lighting is always a bit of a pain, but the last bit I want to mention is to make sure that the warmth of your light matches the vibe that you're shooting for. Warm light is usually cozy, comforting, and inviting, but yellow light is industrial, eerie, and off-putting. Cool light can be calming and serene, but too much blue ends up looking sterile and cold. Again, guess what you can use to nail your lighting? Reference! That's right! Moving on to triggers. There is so much that you can do with triggers. I could honestly make an hour-long video just on them, but in any case, there are a ton of videos out there that cover the basics, but I'm gonna break down a few more advanced techniques by just explaining some of the harder trigger sequences that I've done. I will do a few basic tips first though. Number one is that you wanna do as much as you can off of one trigger. Reason being, it is way the hell easier to get your timing right when everything starts from the same point. On a more basic ride, it might be easier to pair explosions or splashes with individual triggers, but for a lengthy sequence, you want everything to have the same start time. Using one trigger also lets you tweak things precisely and exactly instead of trying to just wiggle the trigger into the perfect spot on the track and hoping that it works. Everything that you just saw happen in this room is off of one trigger. For another example, all of these thermal energy harvesters are on one trigger sequence that's run by this ride way over here. Every time it passes the trigger, the geysers go off in a circle. It's so much easier to have all of this tied to one trigger than to have an individual trigger for each harvester. Okay, most of the time the game will try to organize the items in your trigger list in the order that you clicked them. But because life is hard, there are lots of occasions where the order will get messed up. Thankfully, the items will be highlighted if you just hover your mouse over them. And to make things easier on myself for something like this cannon, I went through and made sure to number everything in order. The bottom of the cannon is made up of these fiberglass panels, but what's actually lighting up are these electrical panels that are tucked inside. To make sure that it looked the same from every angle, I needed a row of them facing left and a row facing right. To make sure I had them in order, I numbered the left side with just numbers and the right side with numbers followed by a hyphen. There are 23 panels in each row. The first one has no delay, but the second one has a delay of 0.01 seconds. The third panel is delayed by 0.02, the fourth by 0.03, and so on and so on until we get to the end of the barrel. To make sure that the cannon stayed lit and then wound down like this, 
the last electrical panel that's delayed by 0.23 seconds is only set to play for 0.1 seconds. The second to last panel only plays for 0.2 and so on and so on until we get back to the first one that plays for an entire 2.3 seconds. It's basically the inverse of the first step. That way the whole thing lights up quick, fires the shot, then slowly winds down. Setting one of these up takes me about 20 minutes. It's not fun. There are no shortcuts that I know of, but it's immensely rewarding because it looks really cool. This sequence is supposed to make you believe that Bloodhound from Apex is using their ultimate to chase you down. When Bloodhound uses their ultimate, their eyes glow bright red. So on the ride, you hear the sound of their ultimate go off, and then the red lights get stronger and stronger as Bloodhound is supposed to be getting closer to rounding the corner. Then, the character you're supposed to be riding with throws a thermite flame grenade to stop them in their tracks just before they round the corner. It looks like this. Those lights are all down here and they activate 0.1 seconds apart from each other, and the back ones stay lit the entire time to make it feel like the light gets brighter and brighter. In the same ride, you've got spots where you get shot at from behind. So in front of the riders, you've got bullet impacts as things whiz by them, of course, but behind the riders, you have lights flashing in time with the bullet impacts to simulate muzzle flashes. To make a muzzle flash, it's just a super quick burst of light, so each light is 0.1 second apart from the one before it, and each one plays for 0.1 second. The thing is, in Planet Coaster, if you have these lights right on top of each other, the game will struggle with those flashes, and sometimes it ends up just looking like one continuous blast of light. So to make sure that you get individual flashes, you stagger the lights in a block like this, to make sure that the position of the light is changing slightly every time. If you want a basic strobe effect though, you can use the repeat toggle option, but with this, you don't have fine control over how long the light stays lit for. So it's better to grab your light than just connect it like 20 times to the same trigger. Then just make each flash be 0.1 seconds apart from one another and have each flash play for 0.1 seconds. This definitely works, but you can see that you still get that issue where some of the flashes bleed into each other, but it's minor, and I think this can totally work if you want to do it. If you want your strobe to keep pace with a moving coaster though, that's when you absolutely have to split your lights into a row and have them spaced out to move forward with the train like this. I think this sequence looks sick as hell though, so it's definitely worth it. Okay, so you see how to tie all your objects to one trigger, how to get your timings down, and how to make some cool lighting effects. There is so much you can do with triggers, but I think that should give you a solid foundation to take your ideas farther. If you have questions or if you want advice on just trying to get something cooler done, just throw it in the comments and I'll do my best to come up with a solution for you. But now, real quick, I just want to show you the coolest use of triggers I have ever seen in this game. This is Nintendo Land, made by SC Reconcile and Kick2. In the Pokemon area, there is only one ride and you have to unlock it. There is almost nothing else for guests to do here, but there's plenty for you, the player, to do. You see, throughout the Pokemon area, they've got sequencers set up. When you visit the park, you click the sequencers and they play dialogue on the screens so that the characters will tell you to go see Professor Oak. Oak tells you to go catch Pokemon and says that your progress will be tracked in here. As you walk through the area, you come across more sequencers where you can catch Pokemon like this. Is that not the coolest shit ever? It gets better. As you go on, you'll run into spots like this. This woman asks you to pick up her package from the store. You go to the store, click the sequencer to pick up her package, and when you do this, this new sequencer gets unlocked back at the lady's fruit stand. Now, as a thank you, she teaches your Pikachu how to use Flash to see in dark spaces, which in turn unlocks the sequencer to open the caves. You go through the caves but are stopped by this boulder. Then you have to go find a strength trainer in the gym to teach your newly caught Geodude strength to move the boulder. You then go back to the cave, and the sequencer for the boulder is now uncovered. You, as the actual Planet Coaster player, get to walk through the park, explore it, have people teach your Pokemon moves, and physically unlock parts of the park as you go. It is literally the most creative, interactive, and fun park I have ever seen in this game, all thanks to their brilliant work with triggers. I just wanted to show you this one to inspire you maybe and show off what can be done with some creative thinking. Okay, the last bit and probably my favorite bit is landscaping. I won't go too crazy here, but it can be kind of tough making somewhat realistic landscapes and to pull it off well. Let's make a hill first. Looky here. 
See how this side of the hill is smooth and this side is more jagged with some cliffs? These are both done with two different techniques. The smooth version is done by just using the raised terrain tool. You start at the top and just do quick little strokes down and out to where you want the bottom of the hill to be. This is what my hand is doing the whole time and this is how I do all of my terraforming. It's all quick strokes, never holding mouse one down for more than a couple seconds until you get to the finer details. After a little bit, you'll get the basic shape down, and then you can go in to even things out a bit if you've got any ditches. After that, just use the smooth brush if you want. For this more jagged look, you follow a similar process, but instead of raised terrain, you use flatten to foundation and keep the brush size small. So as you do those quick strokes down and out, the terrain will form into these flat bits with cliffs, almost like steps. Then you take some of those flat bits and work them around like so. Again, all super quick clicks and strokes. Sometimes to hammer out tighter spots, you'll want to go in a rapid little mini circular motion like this. So you've got a hill. Now what if you want to put a ride on it? You'll want to flatten out a foundation for it, of course, and incorporate it into the rest of the hill. But what about the path? You want it to be even, right? So then you want to flatten out the root for your path, but where it descends, you need to use the flatten to surface or flatten terrain options with the path. The flatten to surface option gives you a more uniform grade. It makes things look a little smoother, but it's really, really hard <laughs> to do. So I would probably just recommend using the flatten to terrain button for the path. But to use the flatten to surface option anyways, you go to the top of the hill where you want your path to start and you straddle the circle over the edge like so. You position the circle to where it's just barely angled down, like maybe 12 degrees, and also make sure that it's not leaning to the side at all. Then drag that through to make a line. Go back and touch up the endpoints with more foundation flattening and smoothing until you get a walkable path. It's hard, but it can be done, and I think it looks pretty good at the end. Sometimes with your terrain and paths, you won't be able to get things perfect, especially in tight areas. A workaround that I found was taking a screenshot of the terrain that I want then throwing it on a big screen so it looks like the terrain, but it's really just a picture of it on a screen. We can also add some cool things like arches, or for more realism, we can carve out some rills or gullies that show where rainwater runs down the hill and prevents grass from growing. We can do this using terrain paints to make the gullies dried out, but if it's too stark, just go back over with grass on a low intensity. You can also be mindful with terrain paints to make bodies of water look more realistic as well. You do the same old technique with quick circular strokes to pull the shoreline out into the water, but then use terrain paints to give it a sandy look that you can see easily from above so it doesn't just look like a sheer drop off into deep water. You can take it even farther and add rocks and plants underwater in the shallow bits if you want to as well. Speaking of the terrain paints, this is my normal selection. The basic rock cliff texture, asphalt because it is very, very useful, this pebble rock texture, two grass textures, a smoother rock texture, this muddy one for underwater, and what looks like mulch for planters or forest floors. For plants and rocks, I really don't have much to say except that to make things look natural, you want to be using rocks and trees and bushes, not just one of them. You want all sorts of things at different heights to make things look alive and pretty. You also hit Z every time you place a tree or a rock in a bush, and then afterwards you should also go back in and select a few of them at random and sink them down into the ground a little bit just to change their height as well. You never want to be able to look at your landscaping and pick out which trees are the exact same. When you're making planters, you want to have tall plants in the back or the center and short plants in the front or around the edges. You can also have groupings of plants like this, where nothing looks too similar but there is an overarching cohesion. It also helps to only use colors that are natural. Bright ass colors can be cool but if your plant looks like it was spray painted or dyed, it's going to be jarring and in my opinion doesn't look that good. More than anything, plants are there to breathe life into your park. You don't need to go crazy with them, but if you have any empty space, make sure that you fill it with some kind of flower or shrub or tree or cactus or rock, just something that'll tie everything together nicely and make it look like you really put effort into every little corner. And that, I do believe, is everything that I can think of to share with you about creating and designing theme parks in Planet Coaster. I really do hope that it was helpful. It was 19 pages of stuff that I wrote and edited down, believe it or not, in the middle of finals. I don't know what I was thinking, but if it helped you out, then it was worth it. If you have any other questions about more specific things that I didn't cover, don't hesitate to throw them in the comments. I'll do my best to help you out. So thank you for listening to my pieces of Planet Park Planning Proficiencies. I hope you have fun building a Planet Coaster, and hopefully I'll see you in the next...